If I tell you that there is a person who has devoted their whole life to memorizing the Quran, and they spend hours and hours, and this, by the way, happens all the time, they spend hours and hours and they memorize the whole Quran, but that person never learns any of the meanings of any of the ayat of the Quran. Never learns the meanings. In fact, actually, you could say there are, um, there are non-Muslim academics that work at universities, and they memorize ayat of Quran in Arabic. But they don't believe in it, they don't act on it. But let's just take the example of just a, um, like a, you know, a Muslim child from a non-Arab country, like Pakistan, India, Bangladesh, some place where Arabic is not the regular language. And they spend their whole life and they study the Quran, but they never, they memorized it, they memorize all the ayat. They know, they know all the letters, they know all the words, they know all the verses, but they never learn what it meant. They never learned what it meant. So would you say that this person has fulfilled the purpose of the Quran? Nobody will say that, right? No Muslim will say that this person has fulfilled the purpose of the Quran. They will actually say that, mashallah, very mubarak, very good, but uh, really missed the point. Is it not? Correct me, please. You can correct me at all. If you think this is I'm off, tell me. You will say, no, you completely missed the point. Everybody here is Muslim. Everybody here believes this, what I just said. Yes? Okay. So, now, I want you to think about that. And I want you to think now about how we learn about nature from a young age when we go to school or your or homeschooling in a curriculum you all the curriculum basically come from the same kind of you know mindset we learn from a young age from kindergarten all the way through 12th grade we basically do hift of ayat. We learn that there is there are different kinds of trees. We learn that there are deciduous trees and there's evergreen trees. And then we learn that if you zoom in on one of those trees, you see a leaf. And we learn that if you zoom in on that leaf, you will find cells. and other kinds of cells that make a cell wall in the plant. And then you learn that if you zoom in even more in the cell, you'll find something called chloroplasts. Has anybody heard chloroplasts? Mm -hmm. So if you haven't, then you're learning about an aya for the first time. There's something called chloroplasts inside the cell, <coughs> and that if you zoom in to the chloroplast, there is something called Chlorophyll, which is a molecule, and it's very difficult to draw, but subhanAllah, interestingly, this molecule actually does take the shape of a daffodil, which is very beautiful. So it actually looks like this. I know it looks like a flower, but actually this is a diagram for a molecule. It actually looks that way. So, you have learned one ion. Two ayahs, nine ayahs, ten. You know, you're, if you want to use each concept, cell is an ayah, chlorophyll is an ayah, uh, chlor chloroplast is an ayah. Let's write it. Let's write it so that chloroplast. There's a thing in here that we in our age call chloroplast. I, I we don't know actually what it's called. Allah knows actually what it's called because Allah created everything and He knows the actual names of things. But in our time, in our context, because of history. It so happens that we have called this chloroplast. On Yom Al-Qiyamah, we will find out what it's actually called. This is called chlorophyll. Okay. Didn't Allah create all of these things? Yes. Right? What's your name? Hanifa, mashallah. Allah created all these things, right? These are all signs of Allah, right? This is also a sign of Allah? Yes. These are also signs of Allah? Yes. Hanifa, if I ask you, 
If somebody memorized this, have you memorized any Quran Hika? Yes. MashaAllah. So if you memorize this ayah, for example, and let's say let's say there's somebody in Ifa who memorizes this ayah, but they go their whole life and they never learn what does this ayah mean. Is that sad? Yes. Sad. But what about these ayahs? These are also ayahs. Aren't these ayahs? Everybody agrees these are ayahs of Allah. Everybody agrees just like the sign that the point is not the ayah, the point is what it's pointing to. Right? So we all know that this has a meaning. And we ask, O oh, Ustadji, oh, what is the meaning of this ayah? You ask your Quran teacher, what is the meaning of this ayah? Because you want to learn the whole point of the ayah. But let me ask you a question. When was the last time you heard somebody ask their science teacher, Oh science teacher, what's the meaning of chloroplast? What is the meaning of chlorophyll? Does this sound like an odd question to us? Raise your hand if it sounds like an odd question. It's an odd question, isn't it? But hold on. Why should it be an odd question? Don't you all believe? I believe. We all believe. We're in this room. We're all la ilaha illa Muhammad Rasulullah. We all believe that chloroplast is an ayah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why has it not ever occurred to me to ask what does chloroplast, what does a chloroplast mean? What does a tree mean? What does chlorophyll mean? Isn't the point of an ayah its meaning? The point of this ayah is its meaning. We all agree in this room that if you go your whole life and you learn these ayah, you memorize them, but you never learn their meaning, you will say, how sad. Completely missed the point. Completely missed the point. But we go through our whole lives, literally doing hips of all these ayat. Uh, you know, if you uh, look, I went into science, and for those, you know, we all have a certain amount of science that we have to do as part of our curriculum. How many little bits of knowledge in our mind? DNA and ribosome and cell structure and, uh, you know, uh, gravity and E equals MC squared and... Uh, Force, physics, forces, are these not ayah? Let, what will happen? You t Isha, you tell me. If you're in a science class and you ask your science teacher, what's the meaning of this ayah? What does it mean? What does chlorophyll mean? Because that's the point. It's the point, yeah? Is it not the point of the ayah? What will the science teacher say to you? Uh, they'll probably explain to me what it means. It will explain to you that this word means this molecule. Yes? Yeah. However, what if you ask them, what does a tree mean? They'll think uh, a little bit puzzled. Why not? They'll be puzzled, won't they? Probably puzzled. Why will they be puzzled? They would assume that I already know what a tree is or what it means. Yes, they will assume that you know that the word, when I say tree, that this equals this thing that we see outside. Yes? Yes. However, when I say, when I say, this is very good, this is very good, what you said is very good. It's making me think. This, by itself, is an is a sign of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Just like this is a sign of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This has a meaning. This mean the meaning of this is this, that's true. But what's the meaning of this? This is one of the signs of Allah. It is a sign of Allah. You are right. Just like this is a sign of Allah. But what's the meaning of this ayah? That's the meaning, right? Yeah. But what's the meaning of this? When you look at a tree, what's the meaning of it? <laughs> Do you know? Like, if we look at it scientifically, um, from my knowledge, yes, is that we see trees as uh, providing oxygen for us. Okay. 
scientifically. Yes, yes. Um, and it could be like uh, we look at trees as providing us food. Yes. And shade. Yes. Because that's what I think about it. This is good. So what you're doing is, so what Ishan is doing is he's going into his knowledge and he's saying, okay, what other stuff do I know about trees? And he's mentioning, okay, trees give us oxygen, trees give food, trees give shade. However, what you just did was you mentioned other signs. Yes? Food is a sign. Oxygen is a sign of Allah. Shade is a sign of Allah. So the way that you answered the question right now was if I asked you, what does this eye mean, this one? And then instead of telling me the meaning of it, you said, well, there's another ayah that says this, and there's another ayah, and there's another ayah, and there's another ayah. But that wasn't my question. Do you see? The question was, what does this mean? We have this, we have this meaning. We understand when we read this that it means something. But when we read this, you don't even know. I mean, what does that even mean to say that a tree has a meaning? A tree has a meaning. Is it not a sign? Any questions? Well, I think when I take a look at the chart on the bottom, that you've you know, broken things out, expanded on. I know. You know. You know, if I take a look at how we were taught what these words meant, yeah. uh, it was just a definition. They were giving us a definition, yes. not necessarily a meaning of what it's pointing to. So right. yes, the chloroplast is this, and it sort of does this, and it looks like, and it may feed on this, but right. it, it doesn't quite tell you why. What's the greater purpose or meaning behind it? So, exactly, exactly. So, you learn, you learn this ayah, 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 just like you learn Allahu Samad, another ayah. Lam yalid wa lam yulad, another ayah. Wa lam yakul lahu kufuan ahad, another ayah. You learn these four ayahs. This is a little bit, it's a strange concept because we're so not used to thinking about it this way. That a tree has meanings. And those meanings, they ultimately go back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the way that we try to understand that is we, tr we do it through understanding Allah subhanahu wa names. So for example, when you look at, uh, if you look at a tree for example, and you see that it has these, this beautiful, grand, you know, uh, all of these leaves that come out. And when you look at the green, it's easy on the eyes. And when you look at the leaves flowing in the wind, then it looks, it gives you feelings of Ease. It gives you feelings of relaxing. It, it makes you feel at ease. When you feel the heat of the sun and then you go underneath that shade, you feel all of a sudden a relief. And so as you feel and experience these things, because you know that this tree is a sign and all of these things you're experiencing from this sign of Allah, you know that Allah is the one that gives you relief. That Allah is the one that is gentle. That Allah is the one that is easy on his slaves. And many, 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 many different names from that tree you will learn. When you mentioned also that the tree gives food. It gives food to us, and it gives food to insects, and it gives food to birds. And the more you learn in your science class all the different things that it gives food to, the more you're able to learn more names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Those names are the meanings of the things that we study. But, so, does that make a little bit more sense now? Let me just stop there. Are there any questions? I, I yes. think maybe just um, maybe explain a little bit about the connection between Allah's names and our reflection of Allah's signs, that connection. Tomorrow. Allah SWT is, okay. So, when we look up, okay, so here's an important thing. All of you guys have young, young kids, okay? How old is Abbas? Is two. So what we want to help ourselves first do and help our children also do from a young age is that when we direct them to look at the signs of Allah in creation, instead of taking them just from one ayah to the next, we want them to whatever ayahs they're experiencing, 
to be able to reflect on their meanings. So, and how do we do that? So just a quick example um, is that you look up at the sky, and instead of, especially if you have a science background, instead of your mind going into why is the sky blue and there's a reflection of the this and then there's bacteria or whatever, I don't even actually really know why the sky is blue, and then there's clouds and you see these big white clouds, and then instead of your mind going to clouds are actually water, droplets, H2O that is condensed. No, this is not the point of the cloud. Allah didn't create the cloud simply so that your mind would just bounce from one sign to another. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created the cloud so that when you look at the cloud, your mind goes from the cloud to Allah. The way that we do that is we say, oh look, look at this cloud. How does that cloud look to you? Just to your eyes. Oh, it looks so white and fluffy. And, but it's fluffy, it, look, it looks soft. And it looks gentle. Yeah, it does. But it's so big. Right, Hanifa? Aren't clouds so big? They're huge. But they're so soft and fluffy. And you feel like if you just hug it, it'll be so nice if you could just sleep on one. Right? Yeah. That's how you feel. You see that response? That's how we should feel when we see a cloud. But even the best part, even better part, is that understand that the reason the cloud is that way is because that's the way that Allah is. The reason the cloud is so big is because Allah is grand. The reason the cloud is fluffy is because Allah is gentle. The reason the cloud is, uh, can turn dark is because Allah also can be angry. And the Prophet وسلم, when he, you know, my, our teacher, he taught us that, you know, if you want to think like the Sahaba thought, how the Prophet وسلم, thought, as best as we can understand from the hadith that we have, then I can, I can pretty much bet that it wasn't when they saw the cloud coming, they're like, is this a cumulonimbus or a cumulostratus? That's probably not what was going through their Mubarak minds. We actually have evidence from, you know, of course, you know, we did, we, we're not there to follow the Prophet ﷺ around throughout his life, but you can get a sense of how the Prophet ﷺ would respond to nature. At one time it was raining and he took off his shirt so, and, and, and exposed his chest to the rain because he wanted to feel the mercy of Allah on his way directly, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Or another time when the clouds were coming and they were looking angry. You know, like clouds look angry sometimes before a storm, like very gray and dark, and like, the, well, like exactly like before a thunderstorm. So the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam saw these clouds and they said his mubarak face turned pale, and he became anxious appearing, and he rushed into the masjid and he started praying. And when they asked him, he said. I was concerned that maybe because a messenger has been sent and the people aren't accepting the message, what if Allah is sending the adab that he sent on the prior nations? But then when I saw that the rain came and it was a mercy, then I realized, no, this is Allah's mercy. Meaning, the, the Prophet is asking himself, in his mind, we could say, what does this mean? Allah is creating these dark clouds. What does it mean? So, does this give a little bit more of a clear understanding that when we say this tree has a meaning, we all understand this ayah has a meaning. We all understand that if somebody memorizes all these ayat, but they never understand what does it mean, it's a chain. But the same is true for these ayat. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah I think what might help is for us to see to feel that Allah, Allah is in the unseen, but He's speaking to us through the signs. Yes, yes. So when we're going for walks or hikes with our children, that's how we're approaching it. So Allah is speaking to me through this tree and through this cloud and through this lake. And as we do our own yes. reflections, we're just naturally sharing them with our children, but even more on their fitra. And they are just in complete awe and uh, naturally just from their fitra. Uh, and sometimes I feel even with non-Muslims, you see this in um, poetry, for 
Yes, definitely. Uh, definitely. Like that poem about a tree. I wonder if I'll ever see a poem as beautiful as a tree. Oh, no. I wonder if I'll ever see a. I wonder, I wonder if I'll ever see a poem as lovely as a tree. I wonder if I'll ever see a poem as lovely as a tree. And it's a whole poem about it. Beautiful, a tree. yes. It yeah, so ends with, uh, with God. Um, yeah. I forget the last um, verse. So, I mean, but only God can make yeah, can you repeat that? Poems are made by fools like me, but only God can make a tree. Poems are made by fools like me, but only God can make a tree. So that's how the poem ends, right? So that's a good example of, you know, yeah. if we do want to bring um, a lot of our reflections and our homeschooling teaching of Allah's signs, you know, with poetry from language arts, that might be a natural way to extend, um, yes. you know, bring about reflection. Yes. Yes, yeah, so, so just a quick kind of step back. The program that you have that you are involved in with the rose garden here. This is very important to, you know, these are, these are um, it's an environment where you're able to explore these kinds of ideas about, you know, sharing like, you know, for example, what, what Sister Sana just said, using poetry at the right age for helping children interact with nature, understand nature, experience nature, and give verse expression to it through these beautiful words, as opposed to just like a textbook that just says this, 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 like a robot, you know? That shouldn't be the means by which they approach Allah SWT signs. Poetry is actually a very beautiful way to approach Allah SWT signs because Allah SWT signs itself are a kind of poetry. Allah SWT signs himself, Allah SWT signs are Allah SWT statements in a sense, right? Obviously the, the statements of Allah in the Quran, they're uncreated, eternal, that's a different matter. But Allah SWT, uh, tr the tree is a created statement of Allah SWT. So we have to ask, what is Allah saying? Now, the, the, what, I, what I wanted to um, share with you, in addition to all of this, is kind of an introduction, is that right now, if you, when, we, when we study science, we become very well practiced over years from K through 12 at learning just what all the signs are and never ever thinking about the meaning. Because we are taking it from a poem, from a people that the way they have structured the curricula, the way that they have, the way that they teach it, and because it's based on what they believe. In, in the people who design the curricula in general, they don't uh, believe that it has meaning. Now, again, of course, there are there are poets and there are people all over that feel that it does. But the issue is that in terms of the pedagogy, meaning the the methods of how it's taught in the classroom, and and that extends to pretty much every homeschooling curriculum as well. Pretty much, I mean, uh, there are. Sisters can correct me on that. But in general, the way that science is taught, the way that we interact with nature is through our science classes. And the way that those science classes are taught is essentially practicing the mind. It's, it's practicing the mind in not seeing meanings. So much so that if you ask somebody, well, what is the meaning of a tree? They will just, I don't really don't understand what you mean. But if you ask somebody what is the meaning of this ayah, they understand what you mean. But it should be that when we're studying in our science classes, that we are constantly learning new meanings as we're learning each and everything. So the, the issue is that we have a very well-structured curriculum in science classes that teaches you to look at everything from like a meaningless perspective. And so what we try to do in, in our was we try to help kids construct their own glasses that they can put on and then pick up any science textbook, for example. And then because they put those glasses on, they are able to see the meanings. And those glasses, what are they made of? They're made of the Quran and the Hadith. So basically what we try to do with Inara, and this is what I'm going to do with you in the last 45 minutes, inshallah, is we try to create, you know, these little mind glasses. That, so you don't have to make a new textbook 
that is like an Islamic science textbook. No, it's not necessary. All we need to do is we need to just understand what Allah has said in the Quran and what the Messenger وسلم, has said and what the ulama have said about those two sources. And we're going to ask you some questions and everybody will then make their own glasses that then they can put them on and they can read these signs and realize and understand what is their meaning. As opposed to, you know, you know just, like, just like we read these signs and we understand what is their meaning. So, that's going to be a little bit abstract, so I'm just going to dive into, into this, and then inshallah, hopefully it will, it will be... Um, Talk about? Just yeah. one thing I was going to say is that, uh, yeah. I, I think one thing with trees in general, or any of the signs of Allah, yeah. is that their meanings can be infinite-less. Or infi yeah, you can have infinite meanings that it points to. So, the, uh, one ayah of the Qur'an, uh, we cannot say that it is limited in its meaning because it's an utterance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, similar, what, what Khidr is saying is that, similar to that, a single ayah, whether it's a tree or a chloroplast or anything else, actually its meanings are unending because it points to the one who is unending and beginningless. So, there's plenty of meaning for everybody. And everybody... We'll all, so anyway, so we'll just we'll just pause there. Okay. Before we go on, um, any co comments or questions? I have like fifty. Anyway, yes, go ahead. Um, I just wanted to mention it somewhat relates. Uh, when yeah. I was younger, yeah. Uh, I heard some elders uh, mention, oh, when uh, when we were reciting certain verses of Quran, when we were reciting certain verses of Quran in that away prayer. Uh, like a lot of people were crying because it was affecting them. But I always thought, like, you know, why are they crying? Like, why is how is it affecting them? What does it mean? So when I was a kid, when I was a child, I, that thought always would come to me um, when I would hear people tell me, like, oh, like a lot of people were crying because of certain items. Like, because when, as a child at that time, you you couldn't understand it, right? So you were like, is that what you're saying? Like, I yeah. didn't know what it meant. I didn't know what so it meant. I, so it couldn't. It wasn't going in. Yes. And the tears weren't coming. No. Yeah. So my goal, my goal, okay, this is, this is my dua. Okay, my dua is that if somebody has to study E equals MC squared, they cry. I want every Muslim, whether they're studying, you know, uh, liposomes or E equals MC squared, that when they read it, they cry. Why should it not be? Because these are the signs of Allah. Why should it not be? Like you're saying. Exactly. This is a beautiful thing that you just said. But I didn't understand the meaning, so I, I couldn't really relate. I, I couldn't understand the meaning of the, of the eyes of the Quran. So the goal is to give a framework, a way of thinking, made up of the basics of the Quran and the Hadith, that now it equips each Muslim that they can read the meanings of the ayah. Just like you need to learn Arabic and... You know, if you want to learn the ayahs of the Qur'an, then you need to learn a little bit of Arabic, and you need to know a little bit of fiqh. If you read the ayah, Aqim al-Salati li dhikri. Establish the prayer for my remembrance. You need to know a little bit of Arabic. These are basics. You need to know a little bit of fiqh. That Aqim al-Salah, what does that mean? It means pray five times a day. What does Salah mean? How do you do that? It means pray like this, make wudu like this, do like this. You need to have, know a little bit of tasawwuf, what's the dhikr. You need to know all of these different things, basics, basics. So that you can understand that when Allah says, establish the prayer for my remembrance, what does it mean? So this is what we're going to try to do here. But instead of for the ayat in the Quran, for the ayat in creation. Now this is the program that we've tried to develop, which we've, we taught our own kids over about six months or so. But we're trying to condense it into like a three, four day intensive for, for young teams. Okay, so Bismillah, let's, let's get started. Yes. I need to you have a question, please. Why would you want to ask a question like, what, why does this mean that? What did, yeah, okay. Like, like, why does the microphone mean that? Why would you ask that? Allah, subhanAllah. Okay, can, can, I, can I make the question easier for me? How about um, what does uh, what about if you want to ask what does the sky mean? 
Are you are you saying that that sounds like a strange question? Yeah, like why would you want to ask it? That's a very very uh, very important question. And I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to continue to show you what I'm going to show you, and then afterwards you can see if it answered your question or if it didn't. I don't know if it will, but I'll do my best. Okay, that's a good question. Hold on to that question. Okay, Nifa, how old are you? Nine. You're nine. Okay, I'll show you. All right. So, all of you are now twelve or thirteen years old, as far as I'm concerned. But you answer the questions as you are. Okay. I'm going to talk to you though, like you are twelve or thirteen. So you just got like three more years. Okay. All right. Okay. So, kids. Is someone? Does everybody here know what is a spectrum? Does anybody know what is a spectrum? Uh, I think I've heard of it. Okay, what is a spectrum? Uh, like or you can give an example, if you. I don't exactly know, but I remember hearing it. You've heard of it. Okay, so I'm going to show you a spectrum. This is a spectrum. We have a hot water tap over here. There's the water coming out. This is the hot water. And we have a cold water tap over here. This is cold water. This is 100% hot water. The hottest, the hottest, the hottest. If you put your hand under this, you might burn yourself. This is really, 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 totally, totally, 100% cold water. 100% cold. 100% hot. Hanifa, how, what's the temperature of the water here? Is it more hot or is it more cold? Uh, it is still hot. Still hot. But is it less hot than here? Yeah. It's less hot than here. Okay. So this is still hot. What about um, uh, oh Mariam? What about the temperature of the water here? It's less cold. It's less cold than here. Yeah. Is there some hotness of water here? Uh, it's two degrees, but not as much as when um, more right. So there is maybe we could say. 75%, for example, cold here, and 25% hot. But it's mostly cold, because it's on the cold side. And, uh, Ishar, what about on this side? It would be 75% uh, hot. Mostly hot, right? It's mostly hot, but there's still some cold, right? Some cold. Um, what about over here? What about here, Rahma? What's the temperature here? This is the middle point. Medium. medium. Close to medium. So medium would be, what does that mean in terms of how much hot is there and how much cold is there? 50-50. Yeah, this is getting close to 50-50, right? We're getting close to 50-50. So, what about, what about right here? Hanifa? How is the water temperature right there? It's not all the way at this side, but it's right next to it. Uh, probably 90. 90 or like 99 percent, right? 99 percent. So wait a minute. That means this is 99 percent cold. Yes. So what's the other one percent? The one percent is the hot. There is a little tiny bit of heat still left. By the time you get all the way to this side, there's still some heat. So a spectrum is when you start with a, a lot on one side and you slowly, gradually become less to the other. Slowly, gradually become less to the other. And you could, you could do the same from this side too, right? It's really cold and it slowly, gradually becomes less. And in the middle is the perfect middle mixing point. And where did you go? Where exactly where they both meet, so I should actually make this more accurate. 
Right here. Right here where they both meet. This is actually the 50 50, right? So this, this is an example of a spectrum. This is actually a two sided spectrum. So a spectrum is when you start on one side and it's a lot, and then you gradually change to the other side. Yes? Any questions? So now I have something to tell you that maybe you haven't heard before. Anifa. But here is this very interesting fact that we learned from Allah and his messenger. That all of Allah's creation is a spectrum. All of Allah's creation. So I'm going to draw this again. But in Allah's creation, instead of hot and cold, and the sky and the, like the sky and the sea. That's interesting. That's a, that's a nice idea. That sounds like heaven and earth, sky and sea. Close. On one side of the spectrum is the unseen world. Like the angels and the sun. This person knows a lot. In Arabic, we call it Adam al Ghayb. <laughs> On the other side of the spectrum, we have the seen world. Or Adam al Shahada. Or another word for it, another phrase for it, which Imam Ghazali taught us, is Alam al al one which means the world of quantity and measurement. What does quantity mean? Is it? Uh, the amount of something? It has to do with numbers, the amount of something. And measurement means that you can measure, measure something. Yeah. So on one side is the world of the seeing, which you can see, touch, feel, hear, smell, taste. And on the other side is the unseen. Like we can't, we can't even, we can't even describe it with your own like. Exactly. So now, now I'm gonna ask. I'm gonna go around. I'm gonna ask each person. I'm gonna say something, and I'm gonna say one creation of Allah. And I want you all to tell me where it should go on the spectrum. So on this side is the seen. On the other side is the unseen. Okay, and this is in the middle. So since we were talking about this, um, Um Hanifa tree. Where? Me? In the scene side. In the scene side. So should I put the, should I put it here? Okay. Does everybody agree that that's where the tree should go? I yes. think it should go uh, very close to where you wrote the scene world. Why 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 should you why do you think it should go here? Because um, the tree is very obvious. We interact with it on a daily basis, and then things that kind of start to transition to the scene world are is that close. So the point that you're making, if I understood you correctly, is that remember that this is a spectrum. So things that are the most seen are all the way on this side. And things that are really, really unseen are all the way on this side. Right? It's all about Allah's creation. But I'm going to leave both these trees up here for now. But I, I tend to agree with Doha, but we're going to see what happens. Okay. How about um, uh, Tariq? What about Jannah? Jannah and Jahannam, we'll put that together. Where should we put that? The unseen. The unseen. Here? Um, maybe closer to the third. Mm -hmm. right. Hanifa, what do you think? I think closer to the unseen world because we can't even see them. So, like, you're saying here, or this is fine? Uh, closer to the unseen. Well, well this, this is all unseen right here. This is from here like, to here. Like, closer to this side. Closer to this side? Yeah. Okay. Does anybody feel differently? 
Okay, so so we'll put Jenna here, and you know, check this. Okay, how about how about um, how about cells? How about cells? Oh, Mariam, where should we put cells? Um, it should be in the portion but more so in the middle because you can well, um, maybe I would put it more so in the like, 50 mark not like, like not in totally in the middle but the 50 of like the I middle know. and the seam so like here more so left here yeah behind the tree here yeah this way cells Yes? Well, I think we were going to put this tree here. So I'm going to remove this tree. Okay. Because remember, it's most seen all the way to this side. And it becomes less seen as you go across, obviously. Right? So, where, where if tree is here, um, where should cells go? Tree, because you, can, you can't see it with like your naked eye, but you would have to use something to see it. So, sorry, before meaning this way or this way? Um, uh, left, left of the tree or yeah, right of the tree? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Right of the tree? Yes. Okay, so uh, like here, for example? Yeah, you can see it there. Okay. So, um, cells are, but Hanifa, do you know what a cell is? You know what a cell is? Okay. Have you ever seen a cell with your eyes? No. No. But you believe in cells? Uh, yeah. But you've never seen it with your eyes? Okay. So, um, do you believe in cells? Who believes in cells? Okay. Who has seen a cell with their eyes? Through microscope and lecture. Okay. <clears throat> Through a microscope, you see a cell. Who has seen a cell through a microscope? Okay, so some people have not. So, Hanifa, you haven't seen a cell through a microscope, yeah? But you believe in cells. So, have you ever seen a cell? No. And Lada, I'm not sitting right next to you, she's never seen a cell. Jabril is over here. He has never seen a cell. Actually, there's lots of people who haven't seen cells, but they all believe in cells. But you've never seen one. So how do you know that it's there? That's what I learned from people who have seen cells. Beautiful. Excellent answer, mashallah. Isha, you've never seen a cell, but you know that cells exist. Yes? But you never saw it for yourself. But you know that there are other people that have seen cells. And you trust those people, isn't it? Right, Nifa? Maybe, did your dad tell you about cells? Uh, I just learned it like, from my teachers at school. You learned from your teachers at school? And you trust your teachers at school, right? Because you should trust your teachers at school. Mm -hmm. Right, Ishra, you believe in cells? Yes. Yeah. But you've never seen it, but you believe in it. Yes. Because you trust... Maybe your dad told you, maybe your mom told you, maybe your teachers told you. Wait, hold on, but what if you saw a picture of a cell in a textbook? Or on a YouTube video? Then can you say you've seen a cell? Uh, no. Not really, right? Yeah, because like, they have drawn it out. Because somebody could have drawn it. It's still just a picture. It's not the actual thing. If you look under a microscope, yes, then you will see for yourself a cell. However, if you haven't seen it for yourself, then you just have to rely you have to trust somebody else. And that's a perfectly fine thing to do. We trust people. I, I, who believes in China? Raise your hand if you believe in China. Everybody believes in China? Has anybody seen China here in this room? None of us have seen China. But China exists, yeah? Yeah. Okay, how do you know that China exists? People have went to China. People have been, but you haven't. So how do you know? How does Hanifa know that China is real? Because she goes up. Because I, because I, maybe 
I, I learned them from, I learned about China, and then now they seem like, I trust in them that China is real, it exists, but yes. Yeah, so, so there were other people that went to China, they saw it, and then they <coughs> came back and they told their family, and their family told other people, and it spread around. And so you learned that, you learned that China exists. China exists. Cells exist. But the way that some people learn about them is by trusting others. Yes? And the way that others learn about them is? By, by trusting other people. By trusting other people in like a chain, right? One person told another, told another, told another, told another. And there's so many people that told you that China exists that you, and you trust all those people. So you said, okay, I, I believe, I trust that China exists. Yes? So, this is something, a very important thing I want to explain to you that if you really think about it, there's really only three ways that you can, that you, Ishra, that you, Umariam, that you, Hanifa, that you, Um Hanifa, that you, Doha, there's only three ways that you can know if something exists or not, or something is true or not. There's only three. And, and now your homework assignment will be to challenge to find something besides these three. What are those three? The first is direct observation. You saw the thing with your own eyes, the actual thing. Not a picture of a cell in a textbook, but you actually looked in a microscope and you saw the cell with your own eyes. You went to China and you saw that China is a place. That's one way of knowing. Directly see, hear, touch, feel. Then the other way, the second way, is what we call sound reasoning. Sound a little strange. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Excuse me. Sound report. Sound report. People have made reports about and stuff? Yes. So, sound report meaning? Uh, like, yes. news and stuff? So, we'll come back to news another time. Let's just pretend that somebody comes through that door right now. And they say, oh my goodness, there's a building down the street, it's on fire. It's on fire. And none of us know this person. He's just a stranger off the street, but he does seem concerned. Maybe we'll believe him. We'll probably we'll probably believe him, but we're not sure. Well, we don't have to. You just told me you believe in China without seeing with your own eyes, right? Like, have to trust them, and and have to make sure that we have to make sure that we exactly have to know them, and we have to get him. So, so the, ideally, yes, you're right. That's the way that it should be. Is that oh, I know this person. Tariq comes. Oh, Tariq comes into the door, and he says, "We need to get out of here. There's a fire next door." And we all trust Omar um, completely. We know him. We know his character. We know who he is. And so we say, "Okay, we we believe you. We don't even need to see it. We just run out the other side." Or, but what if somebody that we, we don't really know comes in? from this side, and he says, there's a fire. And then somebody else comes in from that door and says, there's a fire. And then somebody else comes in from that door, and there's a fire. Now, we don't know any of these three people, but all three of them are saying the same thing. They're saying there's a door, there's a building next door, it's got a blue roof, it's got green doors, it's a very strange building, and it's got a pink walls, and the other one also says, there's a house next door, it's got a blue roof, it's got pink walls, it's got a green door, and the other person says the same thing, and we don't know them, but they're all saying the same thing, so we say, okay, this is probably true, right? This is probably true. So now we have, based on report from somebody, without seeing it, we believe it. And that's perfectly good. Most of our knowledge actually comes from this category, really, if you think about it. I mean, we know all kinds, I know that there's a country called Papua New Guinea, probably will never go there in my life, but I know that it exists, 
I know that there's all kinds of strange sea creatures that I've seen on TV. I wasn't there to see those sea creatures with my eyes. Somebody took a video camera, took a picture of it, and then showed me the image. So that's report. I know all of these things exist. So much, most of our knowledge actually comes from trusting other people. Or like lemurs only live in Madagascar. Exactly, just like that. Lemurs only live in Madagascar. I don't know, how about what if lemurs live in, uh, um, uh, in uh, Ethiopia? No, but from what I say, I read a textbook. In the textbook it said, lemurs live in Madagascar. I trust the person who runs the textbook company, I trust the writer of the textbook, I trust the person who took the picture, and I trust all of the people that worked to get that textbook to me. I'm a very trusting person. I trust a lot of people. But that's okay. That's how it's supposed to be. Who knows what was the name that the Prophet ﷺ was known by even before he received revelation from Allah SWT. Yes, Zahid. <laughs> Al Amin. What does that mean? The truthful. Hanifa? The trustworthy. The trustworthy. And that's my last name. MashaAllah. Beautiful. Beautiful. Those things have such wonderful names. The trustworthy. The Prophet ﷺ was the trustworthy. So, that's the third, that's the second way of knowing something. Now, let's, before we get to the third way of knowing something, we only have ten minutes and this is like another two hours. That's okay. Third, so let's, so let's do this. How about, what about angels? Um, Hanifa, where should angels go on this? On the unseen side. Where should we put angels on the unseen side? Okay, here. Alright. Does anybody feel differently? Yes, um, so, I, physically, I never seen an angel, mm -hmm. but uh, we have heard stories that uh, Jibreel and mm -hmm. did visit the Prophet many times. The Prophet and Prophets in general, they see angels. Yes? Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and feeling. Uh, yeah, oh, oh. Yes, yes, that is that's a very important point, and we're actually going to come to that. But first, who, so prophets can see angels, yes? Yes. Okay, who else sees angels? Uh, of course, Allah SWT sees everything, that's true. But who else in creation sees angels? Yes, sorry. Young babies. We have heard, I don't know exactly where it comes from, but I, I've experienced this and we've heard this from people of knowledge, that young babies can see angels. Hmm? What about outside the human world? Yes? The roosters. The roosters. The Prophet like, hmm? like animals and horses. Yes, animals can see angels. The Prophet informed us that when the rooster crows in the morning, he sees angels. By the way, this is a very interesting point. I was reading about, I was reading some science articles about roosters and when they crow. And they don't crow when the sun comes up or when the dawn comes. They crow right before that. Which is at the Hajjah time, before the dawn comes. There's so many angels that are coming down at that time. So many angels. So that's when the roosters crow. So, and that can help somebody get up. And that can help somebody get up at the <laughs> This is See, that's the most important point. But, so, Hanifa, let me ask you a question. Prophets see angels. Babies can see angels sometimes. Roosters can see angels. So, where should we put angels? Uh, can we sit by, like, probably near the Christmas Over here? Or over here, on the scene side? On the unseen side or the scene side? Unseen. Here. Until, like, 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 older people can't see it. Okay. So, but, but, but some people do. Prophets see, some very righteous people also sometimes can see angels. Like pious. Pious people, exactly. Yeah. Roosters see angels. Roosters are on this side, right? Some are over here. Prophets also here. But, so, so, how can we just leave them over there? Why, why should angels be, I challenge now, the, the folks in the audience, why should angels be only on the unseen side? Because so many people who are, that you see in this room, these kinds of people, Prophet was a human being. Like some people can't see. 
Some people can, some people can. There's there was a hand up. I do think it should be on the same side. It's very close to the screen. Yeah. Um, because it's easier to see the middle You think it should be here? Yeah. But close to the middle mark. The ordinary are not able to see it, but um, the, but the ordinary are if they're able to ascend in their mass. Yeah. And just like they say cell in the scene category, because they are seen in a realm. Uh huh. So I know. That, that sounds very reasonable. There is one thing, though that separates very clearly the things that we know on this side versus the things that we know about from the, on this side. There's two different types of seeing. Seeing from the heart. Yes. So, so this is an important point that um, Sister Sana brings up, is that even though we ordinary people, we can't see angels, but we feel angels. Who has felt? How did Hanifa? How did you feel? Hanifa, have you ever been to Makkah? Yeah. How did you feel when you were in Medina? I felt like I was at ease. You felt like you were at ease. I felt so happy. So happy. Why did you feel so happy? Why do you think you felt so happy in here and at ease? Because I I was like out of a peaceful place. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of peace and quiet around. Do you know what it was that you were feeling there? No. One, of course, the Prophet was there. So you feel the effect of his soul that's there. But the other thing, imagine, can you imagine how many angels there must be in Medina? I can't even imagine how many angels there must be. No. So when you feel that peace in Medina, you are feeling the presence of angels. Actually, you know, one time I was in a masjid in Long Island in New York, and it was the last 10 days of Ramadan, and we were doing our Tarawi prayers, and we invited some non-Muslim neighbors to come and experience the Tarawi prayers. And they sat for the whole tarawih in the back. The women put their hijabs on very respectfully, and everybody sat there. And at the end of it, when they left, they all were saying, so peaceful, so wonderful, so peaceful. Now, they are actually feeling, because the Prophet said that whenever people gather to remember Allah, angels gather around them. And they also stacked that um, all, the way all the way up. So imagine the effect of that. Of course, hearts were going to feel it. But can we know? Let's say there's a non Muslim. They don't know about Allah and His Messenger. But they can feel the peace. So do they know for sure if they don't have somebody to tell them? Do they know for sure that these are angels that is making me feel this way? No. They don't know for sure. They may understand there's something called angels. They may understand there's something called Sakina. That's another thing that Allah has created. Sakina is also a creation of Allah. They understand these things. They understand that they might exist. But do they know that that's the thing that's making them feel at peace right now? They don't know. How do we as Muslims know, though, that angels exist? How do we know? The Prophet, sallallahu al-Amin, the trustworthy, he told us. Because Allah showed him, and he saw it with his eyes and his heart, and then he informed us, because he is a Nabi. Rasul is messenger. What is Nabi? What does Nabi mean? Amir. We say Prophet, but actually what does it mean? What does Nabi actually mean? It doesn't actually... Prophet in English means someone that tells you something about the future. Mm -hmm. Prophet Sallallahu did tell us some things about the future, you know, but that's not all that he told us about. He told us much more than that. What does Nabi mean? Surah Naba. Information. News. Yes. Zahid. News. Meaning, a Nabi is somebody who informs. 
he informs you of something that you can't know otherwise. So the Prophet ﷺ, so the point that we are saying here is that anything that is on this side of the spectrum, the way that you can know about it for sure, for sure, for sure, is through this way, through sound report. Through the Prophet, through Allah or His Messenger وسلم, telling us. Now as we said, you can feel the presence of angels. That you don't need that for. But to know that definitely there are angels, and definitely there's something called Sakina that comes down on the hearts of the believers, and that definitely there is something called Jannah. You need a Prophet to inform you of that. Of course, there are many, many people that, have, uh, that were not Muslim, or not Christian, or not Jewish, and they thought that there must be some afterlife. There are many people like that. They, they realized, they thought, there must be some afterlife. But how can I know? How can I know for sure? There's no way to... Hmm? There's, there, yes, go ahead. Ask people if, if, if this is real. But there's a specific type of person you have to ask. Who is the only person that can tell you for sure if Jannah or Jahannam or angels exist? Like, the prophets? The prophets. The prophets are the ones that have been given knowledge of the unseen and they inform us. That's why they're called Nabis. They inform you of that which you don't know. That's the way that you know for sure. So if you meet somebody and they're like, yeah, I don't know if I believe in the afterlife or I think that maybe there's angels. Or I... That makes sense if they're not Muslim because they haven't accepted a Nabi. Now, of course, Christians will. So Christians believe because they have they accepted Isa alayhi salam. They, they made certain mistakes after that, yes, but they accepted Isa alayhi salam and Isa alayhi salam taught them the same thing that other Anbiya taught. That there's something in Jannah and Jahannam and angels. So, actually, we, we, uh, if there's, we have like maybe two, three minutes, we'll just go right into the end. So, you can't directly observe angels in most cases. But you can know for sure that angels exist through sound report. And you can also experience them and feel their presence. Okay, so then what about... So, we'll, so we'll, should we put angels over here? Angels have to be on this side because you can only know about it from hearing from somebody else. Trick question. Where does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala go? It's a trick question. Remember, this spectrum is about Allah's creation. Is Allah creation? No. No. Allah doesn't belong on this. Allah is above all of this. SubhanAllah. He's above all of this. So this is just about what Allah has created. Okay. Quickly. Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi, where should Wi-Fi go? Um, 50 mark? Here? Anybody agree, disagree? Pretty closer. Uh, not, not by the cells, but in between cells and 50, so maybe closer to the middle line. You feel like it should be over here? Yeah, sure. Why? Can you tell me why you think Wi-Fi should be there? Have you ever seen Wi-Fi? No. It's unseen. Yeah, maybe you could feel vibrations of Wi-Fi. <laughs> uh, it can be uh, uh, quantified and measured. You can measure Wi-Fi, yes? You can use it and you can measure it. So it goes in this world of quantity and measurement. But it is kind of, it's more unseen than cells. Yeah? yeah, and cells are more unseen than trees. So remember, this is the spectrum. It's becoming more unseen as we go this way. Okay, now, last one minute. This is usually a half an hour conversation, but we're going to do it in 30 seconds. Where should the human being go on this? Yes, Hanifa. It's going to be like all the way at the left because. You can see people all the time. Like, like, Mashallah. Many, many people, people now. Almost everyone. 
everywhere. Yes, you can see people everywhere. So you should put it all the way here. But hold on, it's not so simple. Yes, go ahead. Yes. Because human being has so many parts. Yeah, arms, legs, lungs, heart, eyeballs. Yes, many parts. There's the physical outcome. Obvious part of the movie that we can all see is that all the way on the obvious part of the spectrum. Mm -hmm. There's the inner parts of the organs and whatnot, and that we can go into the more into the spectrum, into the x-rays, mm -hmm. and then the whoa, 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 wait a second. Hold on, honey, but do you have a soul? Yes. Yes, we have souls. So where does the soul go? Because all humans, because Doha, Abi, what she said, she, we have souls. So where should the soul go? I think we the Okay, so we're going to put the human here. And we're going to put the soul over here. So I don't think the human can be placed in a specific part of the spectrum. Mm. Ishra, what do you think? Um, soul is just brain anyway, right? <laughs> no, I don't think so. Don't think so? I feel like maybe you could put it being right in the dead center. Why did you say dead? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so then we should put it this way. <laughs> right in the dead center. Hmm? So at this point, this is when I pick on the kids and I ask them. I, I ask that I ask them to tell me how do they, you know, know that I'm talking to them. And they're like, "Well, my brain does this, and my brain does that, and my brain does this." So then, then we explain to them. I we tell them a whole story. We're going to quickly go through because otherwise they're going to do a bummer, right? So the, 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 we tell them a whole story that you live your life, you go through your life, imagine that you become grandpa one day and then you're on your deathbed and then you are lying there and then all of a sudden you see the angel of death coming to you. And because Alhamdulillah you lived your life well, it looks beautiful. He looks beautiful. And the angel of death takes you and now you are above your body and you're seeing your body and you see your family come into the room and they realize that their grandfather passed away and they start crying. And you feel bad, but what you feel mostly is you feel very much like a thirst that you want to be buried. And then they wash your body, and they're very careful when they wash your body because the Sharia says that because actually you feel everything that they do to you. And then when they put you in the grave, you see everybody, the last person walks away, and then you see Munkar and Nakir come. And then you start, you have to answer the questions. And then after they leave, inshallah, your grave is expanded. Then you feel at peace. And you actually, Imam Ghazali says, you will actually remember to the point that even that when I was in the dunya, I used to wear such and such shirt. And the person who is in regret will feel deep sadness and pain and regret. So you are in the grave, you are seeing, you are hearing, you are feeling, you are thinking, you are experiencing, you are remembering. But your brain is being eaten by worms. Just like right now you are seeing, seeing and hearing and thinking and feeling. It is because you are not your brain. You are your soul. Right now when you hear me and you're thinking about what I'm saying and you're thinking and you're worrying about Salah, it's all your soul that is happening. So Salah has started. We're going we're gonna to just completely ruin it and we're going <laughs> to just do it this way. Human being cannot go in one place like Doha said. The human being is actually their own spectrum. And it goes across the whole thing. Because you have your body and you have your heart and you have your cells and you also have kind of a Wi-Fi that goes between your heart and your brain and you have aql and you have nafs and you have qalb and you have sir and you have ruh and it goes from all the way one side to the other. And this is why Allah SWT says that we will show them our signs outside and within themselves. Always it's the whole world and also the human being, which is also the whole world. So the body parts of a human does not belong in the spectrum. You know what? Let's quickly meet after Salah, inshallah. We'll take questions and then we'll finish. That's a good question. Hold that question. We were asking a question before. We were saying that the human being, we have a body like our arms and legs and everything inside. But we also have cells inside us too, right? Yeah. Our body is also made of cells. But I'm asking, like, do humans belong in the, the spectrum that we're working on right now? Because like, I know that humans are almost creation, but like, yes. that where our, where our spectrum belongs in this. Well, so this is, the, this is the issue, right? Is that human beings, 
we have our own spectrum. We have right because because why? Think about it. You have your arms. That you can you see my arms? Yeah. You can see me. So I have to be here, like next to the tree, right? Mm -hmm. But I also have cells. No. My body, all my body, your body are made of cells. And your and your soul. And and we also have soul, but soul goes <coughs> would go over here, right? So it's like my arms and legs go here. The cells that my arms and legs are made of go here. And then did you know also we have Wi-Fi inside us? Did you know that? Uh, it's not exactly Wi-Fi, but they're in our heart. Our heart sends special, like kind of like radio waves. They're like unseen like, radio waves. Yeah. I also know that there's like nerves connecting from our brain to all our parts of the body. Yeah, nerves are cells. Nerves are a kind of cells. So that's nerves. And then I don't know if you know guys know this, but you can actually measure the effect on the heart of uh, feelings of gratitude. So if somebody is feeling grateful, you, that actually looks a certain way when you, you can actually measure, uh, you know, you have a heartbeat, dub, 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 dub. It's not exactly regular. It's not like dub, dub, and then 50 milliseconds, dub, dub, 50 milliseconds, dub, dub, 50 milliseconds. It's not like that. There's, between each heartbeat, there, the, the time changes a little bit. And when we measure those time changes, it's called heart rate variability, meaning the time between each heartbeat changes. And so when we measure those changes, we can actually find patterns. That when somebody is feeling grateful, the heartbeat variability looks different. It looks like a smooth line. And when somebody is feeling agitated or hateful, the heart rate variability, you can measure it, you can trace it on a piece of paper, actually looks angry. And they've also measured that, that depending of course on the strength of the person's gratitude and their soul and all these things. So we want the same world because it's the world of quality. Oh, this is like my top student right here, mashallah. Yes, absolutely. So the heart belongs, but where is the sugar in the heart? Where is, the, where is that sugar happening? Is it? Hmm? Uh, yeah, which is, so where, where does that come from? Okay. It comes from our soul. The sugar is in your qalb. Qalb is not this thing inside here that's beating like this. The qalb is something that is unseen. So you have gratitude, you feel sugar, you feel gratefulness in your qalb. And your physical heart over here responds to that. And we can measure that. We can measure the effect of the unseen. And you have your aql, and you have your nafs, and you have something called khayal, which is our imaginative faculty, our imagination. Imagination doesn't just have to do with unicorns. Imagination is something much more grand than that. It is a whole different discussion that we will get to another time, inshallah. But the point is, like Hanifa was saying, is that we, we need our own spectrum. Because you can't just put a human being just here because we're not just jism. It's not just our body. And we can't just put it over here because it's not just spirit or ruh. So actually, the human being is also his, his own spectrum. And then if you take the whole course, right, what you will learn by the end of it is that actually Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made the seen world very small compared to the unseen world. So actually, it's not really, it's not really like this. What I, what I showed you here was just a teaching tool. It's not actually, it's not actually like this and this is unseen and this is seen. It's actually like this. And this is seen. And this is all unseen. The Prophet said that this, that the, we have seven heavens. And the lowest heaven, which is when you look up at your, our entire universe, it's our, it's like the love is, is yeah, it's the lowest heaven. So meaning, 
the whole universe from Big Bang and everything, all of that, every single galaxy and all of the stars <coughs> that it takes light millions of years to travel through is Sma'a Dunya, the lowest heaven. The Prophet said that the example of the lowest heaven to the second heaven is like a ring in a desert. So this whole universe that is expanding in every single moment is like a ring in the desert compared to the second heaven. And he said the second heaven compared to the third heaven is like a ring in a desert. And the third heaven, yes? So it goes exactly. By the time you get all the way up the seven heaven, it's ring in the desert, ring in the desert, ring in the desert, all the way. And then actually if you look at that it says, the throne, the seven heavens and the kursi all together are like a ring in the desert compared to the throne. The greatest. It's the biggest create. Yes! Allah Akbar, I love these kids. MashaAllah, they are just on it. MashaAllah. What's your name? Shayma Al-Hanifah Allah Akbar, MashaAllah. Very nice to meet you, Shayma. So, what that shows us is that actually the scene is like tiny. It's like, the, I call it the iceberg principle. You know icebergs? Mm -hmm. yeah. The iceberg is like, it looks really big when you look at it on top of the water, but when you look under the water, it's actually like this. Uh -huh. On the top, it looks really big. It's like the bottom is like, like a big iceberg. It's huge, it's much bigger. It's a, you call iceberg principle, or actually it's called the upper principle. Always, everything you look at in this dunya, always it's actually bigger. It's actually much greater. Because our lives, like what I think it is like, uh, like this mountain, like the little mountain at the top, and then there's a gigantic mountain that's not over. Yes, and it's like huge underneath, right? Yes, exactly. So then we do all of this kind of step by step. We show the kids different Quranic ayat and hadith. We have conversations. We kind of take it, and so that they just like what we're doing with Hanifa. And they answer the questions, and they will try to put it. We, we do more examples so that it kind of goes. And then we, we said, well, Allah SWT actually said that there's seven heavens. So this is also still not correct. Because actually, what it's really like is like this. This is Alam al Kamiya wa Niqdar, our seen world. That's really tiny, like, that's very much like the center And this is the unseen. The unseen. And these are seven heavens. One, two, three, one, two. So this is the first one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And remember, and this is actually not even correct because remember, this whole heaven, which is our whole universe, is just a ring in the desert compared to this one. And this is just a ring in the desert compared to this one. And this is just a ring in the desert compared to this one. And this is just a ring in the desert compared to this one. So actually it gets, it gets so big that I couldn't even fit it in this room, let alone in this sky. That's how big it is. And we will talk more and more, but remember, as we, we talk about there, then there are patterns. We don't, can't go into all of it. But Allah SWT has told us much more about all of this. The Prophet ﷺ has told us a lot about, you know, that Allah SWT, He gives a command. That when He gives a command, every single time He gives a command, Allah SWT gives... Did you guys watch that video on the, the, the thing that we sent? In that, you see when he talks about shooting stars. The Prophet is informing about shooting stars. That when Allah SWT commands something, he, they, first when he utters 
gives the command, the angels by the throne, they subbaha, they glorify Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then the angels in the next heaven down, they hear that glorification, and then they glorify Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then the angels in the next heaven down, they hear that glorification, and then they glorify. It keeps on going. It keeps on going all the way until the angels all the way down here. And then the Prophet said, the angels at the Sama al Dunya, or he doesn't just Sama Dunya, but he says the angels somewhere from further down, ask the angels that are near the throne, what has your Lord commanded? So then the Prophet, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, so then the angels inform them. So the angels that are up here holding the throne, they up up here, they tell, give the command. They say this is what he commanded. So they say it to these angels, who then 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 say it to these angels, who then, angels, who then make that command occur in this life. So this is happening at all moments for every single thing that is happening in creation. That means it's been a lot of work. The angels have a lot of work. And there are a lot of angels. And there are other things that we can learn that become important, that become part of developing the mindset of meaning, to be able to look at the creation. So, for example, that some of the, the ulama, that they say that as you go up further in the heavens, it's, things become simpler and clearer. And as you go down towards our world, things become multiple and more and many, and less clear. You can kind of think of it as like, the higher you go, the purer it is, and the lower you go, the more murky it gets, you know? If you kind of imagine Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as being above all of his creation, obviously Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not in any direction. We all know this is aqidah, we discussed these things. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not in any particular direction. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not literally sit on his throne. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not above or left or right or up or down. The directions do not apply to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But we have the, the way, the system that he has created in his creation is that as you go higher, you become pure, which makes sense. As you go higher, it becomes pure. And as you come down, it becomes less pure and more things. And impure, and a little bit darker as you come down. And there's, there's much more we, we talk about. So by the time we are done with all of this, then we can now talk about anything. We can talk about natural selection, we can talk about physics, we can talk about chemistry, and we know where it goes. We know what we're talking about. It's all right down here. And we know that everything that happens down here, it only ever happens as a result of the command coming all the way through. So when you see a tree, and you see, and, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is above everything, and Allah and all of His beautiful and magnificent names are above everything. And, and so when you see a tree, you are, what you are actually seeing is not a tree. What you are actually seeing is the command of Allah that has, as if it has taken the shape of all of his names that make up that tree. He is gentle, and he is kind, and he, is, he provides risk, and he is firm, and he is strong, because the bark is firm and it's strong. And he is, you know, all, all the reflections. The, the point of it is not that we feed you feed children reflections. That's not the point. The point is not to be like, hey, when you see a tree, it's A, B, C, D, E, F, G. These are all the names of Allah. You should memorize this for this. That's, that's not the point. The rest of the scenes, they're laughing. So I love them. The, the point is, we give all of the background knowledge so that everything that you look at, you realize, oh, this is so much greater than just the thing that I'm looking at. When I look at this tree, this is actually the result of this command that is coming down. And, 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 it, and all of his names and what names are manifest in this tree? Now that's called science. That's the whole point of studying nature. The whole point of studying nature is to understand what is its meaning. What names of Allah are here? What, what, does, this, what does this really mean? I, I was talking to Philip just now about, uh, in for, for future sessions, 
to do some exercises that we can do uh, do kind of these exercises where we can we talk we look have a tree or we have you know whatever whatever it is and then we can go through and reflect on the meanings of it. Um, there, there's a lot more. This is done. This is normally this is something that's done over like you know weeks. So we tried to condense it into a couple hours. So inshallah we'll stop there because it's two o'clock. If there's any questions, comments, or you know anything, inshallah. Carrying out a walk or a hike where this type of process is being modeled by the person who's leading. Yeah. And, and you know, it's just kind of absorbed and experienced by the other parents. And the children might be an experiential way of doing it. Yeah, I know. Yeah. yeah. That is, uh, that's, so that's, you know, the kind of work that you're doing at Rose Garden with the kids from a young age, that's very important. This is, what, if you can just take one thing away from when you talk to your children, about anything in the, in the creation. If, if they're coming up with their own explanations for things, that's good. Let them give their own explanations. But sometimes they'll say, Mara, do you know why you know, the, the tree plant glow grows like this? And then they'll say something that is like completely not what is the reality. But it's okay. Don't have to correct them, especially at a young age. It's just let them explore. But rather also to turn their attention more to looking and experiencing things, what you experience with your eyes and your ears and your touch and your taste. Instead of giving them bits of information that it took actually 500 years, years to understand, okay, Bob is actually condensed H2O, which is actually not even really true in reality, but for, for whatever, that's what it says in the textbook. It took us like a thousand years to get to that point. It doesn't really help you do anything, especially not at a young age. Rather, what we want to teach our children at a young age is what's important to know about nature. That this tells us about something about Allah. So the way to do that is that what they do at the Rose Garden and, and other places is, uh, actually I don't know what I mean, but this is, the Rose Garden is like this, I know who does it, <laughs> is that, that they have them experience through their senses. Just, that's all you need. That's what Allah gave us. That's all you need. You, you look with your eyes. What does the cloud look like? What looks soft? It looks perfect. What does this feel like? Oh, it feels hard. It feels rough. It feels like oh, it feels it feels like silk. What does it? What do you hear? How does it make you feel? I mean, you know, it doesn't have to be, uh, you know, it doesn't have to be, you know, just with, with words. How does it make you feel? Write an essay on it. That's how I, that's how I work. But for kids, for kids, it's more just just natural in the moment, present in the moment. They don't need these. Scientific explanations keep those away from their minds from at a young age Because what you want is you want to exercise not the ability to figure out what's the scientific explanation for this You want to exercise their ability to connect everything that they're seeing back to Allah SWT. And you realize that if you want to help your child do that you have to do that yourself But that is actually the harder work That's uh, that is actually the harder work and that's that's where the discussion is <laughs> Basically, exercise the Marifa muscle. Exercise the Marifa muscle. <laughs> and by, by the way, by the way, all of this stuff, right? All of this stuff is really 10% of the formula. So if we're talking, if our goal is to preserve our Iman and to draw closer to Allah through whatever it is that we study, then the way to do that is 90% of it is matters of the heart. And 10% of it is matters of the mind. So 90% of it is the love that you show your children. The, you know, you tell them to make dua. We need, a, we need to find a parking spot. Make dua. They made dua, you found a parking spot. Going to Mecca, going to Medina, going to the masjid, going to school. They have a nice person. that Positive experiences, beautiful experiences. Feeling the peace of the masjid, feeling the peace of the dhikr gatherings, parents that are, you know, taking care of each other and taking care of the kids, and all of just the things that you all we all do as parents. Just you know, we do our best. It's all in Allah's hands. We just do our best. We don't have to be perfect. We just have to do our best for Allah's sake, right? So just that that's ninety percent of it. But the ten percent that's left is kind of like configuring the mind to deal with what's going to be a lifetime of studying science from a perspective where they where they really, they say you know it's, it's really exercising the meaningless muscle you know that's how it's taught in the way that it is so, okay okay fine 
They want to present it that way, fine, let them present it that way. We just need to put on the right glasses. So that when we look and we study these things, we can make these connections. So for, you know, we can, we can see, we know from the hadith that the Prophet said that the roosters, they crow when they, they see the angels. And then we know from the science that the roosters, they crow not at the dawn, but before the dawn. We know that that's the same, that's the same time as the Hajjah. Now, in those articles that I was reading, they were going into the, the biological clock of the rooster, right? And they're going into the brain chemicals of the rooster. And that's all there. Those are all signs of Allah also. However, what the point that they are missing is that all of those things that are happening inside the rooster, that are happening inside the rooster, all of the brain chemicals or whatever it is that they were talking about that happened, that, that, that is associated with the rooster crowing, the source of all of those things happening are commands that are descending from the Sabah Salawat down. That's how it happens. You're missing the picture if you don't realize that. Actually. That's actually how it happens. So for example, when you hear that, uh, uh, you know, your, um, uh, you know, your, um, your, in the brain chemicals, this person is depressed, this person is sad, so we measure their brain chemicals and it was low, and so we find there's an association between low brain chemicals and depression. Okay, fine. But actually, what is the root cause of that? There's a soul, and something's going on with that soul. And as a result of that, those brain chemicals are changing. This is, the, this is actually the, the reality of everything in this, in this world, is that it sources in the unseen, and it manifests in the, in the seen world, like a waterfall that's, that's coming down at all times. So this, this is all stuff that, you know, through many examples and discussions and you know different things, we kind of try to try to kind of create this mindset or this glasses of this way of looking at things, so that you can read about e equals mc squared. You can read about chloroplasts. You can read about chlorophylls. You can read about trees. You can read about this. You can read about that. And it's just subhanallah. They're now actually even saying just from our observation. So alhamdulillah, finally they'll catch up to what the hub is. It will take them who knows how many years, right? So anyway. Okay, so we'll come up with this. Okay, any questions we can ask them? And then, what is this? This one, CP? Uh, one question I had from the video when you spoke about the two buckets. Yeah. And um, you know, a very significant level of conflict between the two buckets being the two etc. Yeah. Um, so, is that something that is directly addressed in terms of them prioritizing, of understanding knowledge, and then being able to prioritize it and fit it where it belongs? Yes. They don't fall into that. So you know how we kind of introduce this idea of layers of creation? So we go into that a lot more. And that's all, um, the first, we have two courses. The first course is the uh, foundations, knowing the world and knowing yourself. In that, we do the spectrum more at length. We talk about the human being, and then we talk about the layers of creation. And actually, we have a whole unit on what is the human being, because there is a lot of claims about what we are in, in when you're studying natural science, or you're studying psychology, or you're studying these things, there's a lot of claims about what the human being is. Mm -hmm. Just a bunch of chemicals bouncing around in our heads and that produces all of our behavior. Like I had a neurobiologist tell us all standing in, in my biology class that I have no free will because it's just my uh, neurochemicals bouncing around in my head. To which of course the response is to go and punch him in the face and then tell him that I had no free will because it's just the neurochemicals bouncing around in my head. But that, you, giving them the actual, the actual, uh, what is the human being, where we talk about what is the qalb, and what is the purpose of the qalb, how does the qalb know, and how is it different than how the aql knows, and what is the aql, what are the layers of the aql, and what is the nafs, and what is the khayal, and what is the relationship between all of these things. So we, did, we go through all of these, that's like a whole unit, and then the third unit is the layers of creation, we talk about that, we talk about the and then we have a second course called Introduction to Sciences. In that is where now we get into understanding what is a science, and what are the different sciences, where do they go, 
how do they correspond to the different layers? And so you can kind of see where everything plugs in on the spectrum. And so, so, and so that's very, and that's actually, this is all work that has already been done by Ulama from centuries ago. Anytime somebody would study any science, whether it was uh, rational, we didn't have a difference between secular and religious. There was revelatory sciences, those that relate to revelation, and rational sciences, those that relate to human efforts at understanding. And in that division, the rational sciences would be also things like physics and chemistry and anthropology and biology and all of those different things. And in that, there's, they actually have this concept called the Ten Principles, that before a student would start studying any, any science, they would uh, understand these ten principles of that particular science, which was what is the goal of the science, what is the intent behind the science, what are the methods of the science, who is the founder of the science, and it contextualizes it and it plugs it in, what's the, what's the point of it. There, there's all these, there's ten, ten principles. And that places it in the mind that, okay, where does this go? What's the, what's the purpose of this? What's the purpose of studying biology relative to my purpose in life? What's the purpose of studying uh, chemistry relative to the purpose of my life? What's the purpose of studying uh, sociology relative to the purpose of my life? That, it was, this work has already been done. It's just sitting in the books. So, yeah. Uh, uh, the, the brothers asked me to use the microphone so that it could be recorded. But she was saying that Sheikh Hamza Yusuf had, um, that before starting the Sira? Before starting an introduction on the Sira lecture, we started by mentioning the ten principles. The ten principles of the Sira. The, the, she mentioned that Sheikh Hamza, before teaching the Sira, he, would, he, he went over these ten uh, Masha, foundational principles. So this is actually something that we want to develop for modern biology because that hasn't been done yet. So we want to develop it for modern biology and physics and all of these things, so that we can see where that fits in. And we can also see where the old sciences fit in, because they still have a role also. The old physics and the old, bi old biology and the pre-modern chemistry, which we call alchemy, these also have a certain, they have a less role, but they have, there's certain things that are important to understand about them, so that we don't have a relationship with them that, oh, that was then, we didn't know anything, now we figured everything out, that's not the case. There's a whole uh, spectrum also there as well to understand. Uh, so, so yeah, we do address it. I'm also wondering, uh, especially when you, you know, are going to be teaching about what a human being is, the definition of a human being, just that alone and understanding that, um, and later on, when you start studying the social sciences, let's say psychology, mm -hmm. or you start studying education, um, you know, you would hope that the student would then say, oh, okay, so the perspective of Sigmund Freud in terms of his definition of the human being was such and such, mm -hmm. and our yeah. definition of the human being is such and such. Therefore, right. his conclusions on what would help a human being recover from quote-unquote trauma yeah. will naturally be different than our, um, you know, Adama and what they would have to say. Or similarly for education what Maria Montessori or um, you know Howard Gardner might say about what is best for a child at age three, four, will right. actually differ because of their definition of the human being versus ours, and how do we interact yes. with the two. And, and not just their definition of human being, but also this whole spectrum and the unseen, because okay, Shaitan exists, yes? But a psychologist that's trained in modern psychology doesn't believe that Shaitan exists. So that means that their entire schema of mental health means that every single thought that you have, it comes from yourself. Whereas if you know that actually thoughts come from shaitan, thoughts can come from angels, thought can come from Allah, thought can come from else outside, then when certain negative thoughts come into the mind, we actually have the option of knowing that, oh, actually this has nothing to do with me. This is not from me. Like Yusuf Islam said to his brothers, he said, it's shaitan that did this. He, he you know, that was his... This is not from you. Meaning, a modern psychologist who doesn't believe in shaitan, he will actually tell this person with all the authority of, of science that well, you, you're thinking this, but you have a problem. Whereas somebody who just understands these basics, if they think about it, they're like, oh, that, that's shaitan, don't worry about that. Well, how difference is to tell somebody that you're, you're really messed up versus you're fine? This is shaitan, don't worry about it. 
Okay, yeah, they might have to do their own journey of trying to ignore that because, but that's a very different starting point than, yeah, this is all coming from you and you know, it's, you just must have had some really bad trauma when you were a kid. Go and yell at your parents. You know? So so the 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 yeah. Versus the psychologists who might, you know, draw conclusions about a person themselves being malicious or. Every everything is from Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, even including all the things that people do to us from our perspective, is also from Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. Everything is a test from Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. You have a choice. You can get lost up in the in the people that are in front of you, or you can think about the one that is in charge of everything. So I think uh, I think we're getting finished on time now. So inshallah uh, we'll, we'll finish with that. Yeah. yeah uh, so my wife had prepared the tea, and so he wants to make sure everyone. Oh, gets okay, some please, tea yes. Is that the thing? Is that the thing? So where, where should we have where should we have the? So the brothers can probably go first, and then we can be out, so the sisters can then go. So when the, when they take the tea, where should they go after that? Uh, outside, there's a place. Yeah, we can just go outside. Okay. Yeah. I okay, so Bismillah, brother, brothers, if you'd like to help yourself, I'll join you in each other. And then yeah. we'll take the one. Bismillah. Uh, yeah, if you want to just make a du'as at the same time. I'm uh, sure. Bismillah, brother, you're from the Lord, Rabbi Al-Amin, and sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allahumma anta salam wa minka salam tabarati ya adam jalal wa akram. Allahumma inna ala zikrik wa shukrik wa husna ibadatik. ربنا ظلمنا أنفسنا وإن لم تغفر لنا وترحمنا لنكونن من الخاسرين. يا الله يا أرحم الراحمين يا الله. We ask that you always connect us to you through your creation and through your Quran. يا الله. We ask that you teach us the meanings of the Quran and give us the tawfiq to act on them. And we ask that you teach us the meanings in your creation and teach us to act on them. يا الله. We ask that you grant everybody here opening and tawfiq and shifa. يا الله. We ask that you grant this to all the Muslims. يا الله. We ask that you grant us your maghfirah and your rida. And we ask that you grant this to our parents, and to our families, and to our teachers, and to all the Muslims. And Ya Allah, we ask that all the people that are here in this home that you have sent us to, Ya Allah, we ask that you guide them to your deen, Ya Allah, 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 Ya